Hi, I'm Femi OK. On today's episode of The Stream, drought, the climate crisis and extreme hunger in southern Madagascar. Our guest today will make the connection between all three of those issues. But first, let's start with two families doing their best to survive drought after drought after drought. I rely on God. Today we have absolutely nothing to eat except cactus leaves that we are trying to clean up. We have nothing left. Their mother is dead and my husband is dead. What do you want me to say? Our life is all about looking for cactus leaves again and again to survive. In the morning, I prepare this plate of insects. I clean them up as best I can, given the near total absence of water. It's been eight months that my children and I have been eating this plant, every day and exclusively, because we have nothing else to eat and no rain to allow us to harvest what we have sown. So joining us to talk more about the situation in southern Madagascar, we have Shelley, Marie, Christina and Charles. Thank you so much for being on the stream today. Shelley, it's good to see you. We've worked with you on the stream before. Remind our audience who you are and what you do. Thanks so much. I'm Shelley Thackpool. I am with the World Food Programme. I cover the Southern Africa region and I have just got back from Madagascar. I spent just a little over a month uh, down in the south, down at that uh, epicentre of the crisis that we are going to discuss this evening. Thanks for joining us. Marie Christina, welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself to our viewers around the world. Uh, so, hi everyone, thanks for this opportunity to share. I'm Mary Christina Kolo, I'm a youth activist from Madagascar, a climate activist and eco feminist. I've been in the South yesterday and also um, two, a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm, mobili I'm mobilizing youth and women's organizations regarding this issue now. All right, more from you, Tina, in just a moment. And welcome, Charles, to the stream. Please introduce yourself to our viewers. Well, thank you for the opportunity to engage with you uh, today. I'm Charles Ouba, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Action Against Hunger. And we are working one of the very few organizations working in the southern you know, part of uh, Madagascar. So, Charles, you sent us some video. You shared some video with us. It's drone video, and it shows us quite clearly what is happening as far as the drought's concerned. If we look at this video, what are we seeing here, Charles? You're seeing an area that has been affected, you know, um, over a number of years where the rainfall pattern has changed significantly. And so the area is very dry. As you walk in, you find that you have winds that have already taken a lot of the soil to be able to blow it away. The organic matter layer, the topsoil, which really helps plants to grow, it's already gone. And so we're talking about an area that is very desperate because there is no food. Because of the reduction in rainfall pattern that we've seen over the last four decades, but then the last three years, we have seen drought, not a single drop of rain in that area. And so people are beginning to starve and children are suffering. That's what we're seeing in this area. To hear that an area of the world there is no food. Shelley, I could see you shaking your head as you were watching those, those, I'm going to literally pour, in the literal sense of the word, poor families working out what they could eat that was around them, foraging. What are people eating? What did you see people eating? Absolutely. And um, I met the, one of the mothers that you, that you showed uh, in the film, uh, Tamara, and she had that plate of cactus seeds in front of her, um, children just picking picking the seeds. These are coping mechanisms. Can you imagine just opening your fridge and there being nothing in your fridge um, and, and just the cupboards are bare? And these people don't even have utensils. They've sold everything. She told me that, you know, even if I was to find something to eat, I don't have firewood, I don't have utensils, I don't even have a spoon nothing to cook with. Um, and, and just to go back to what Charles is saying, it's desperate. I mean, water, water, not a drop anywhere. Tina, people will be watching our conversation and they'll be thinking, hold on a minute, Madagascar, tropical paradise. 
what's going on here? There's a difference between the geography and the climate in the northern part of Madagascar and in the southern part of Madagascar. Give us a very quick climate lesson about your country. Exactly. Uh, currently, Madagascar is among the most vulnerable countries regarding climate change impact. We are, uh, we are in the top 10 regarding climate impact. And uh, as a tropical country, people used to think that Madagascar is a lush and green country uh, with, uh, with forests. But we have this diversity in, and the climate impacts are different from region to region in the north and the south. Uh, west and east, we we have uh, regular cyclones. Uh, we we also have uh, we have drought in the south, but we are also victim of flood in the north. So our country is already very vulnerable and unfortunately quite invisible at an international level. We are not often heard during international negotiation like COP. We are not even considered, uh, and especially. Um, especially as um, as an island, uh, which is uh, sometimes known as a cartoon. People they, they sometimes they, they think that Madagascar doesn't even exist. And what I wanted to share, I don't want to share you some data, but I, I want to share you some stories because um, what does it mean for Madagascar to be among the most vulnerable country regarding climate change? Uh, especially in the eastern south of Madagascar, it, 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 it means that, uh, of course, people, they, they don't have food. Uh, we, we saw it in the video, but this is not only a question of food and famine. It's also a question of human rights, because um, today uh, in this eastern south of Madagascar, um, we also have this patriarchal system where when you're a woman, when you're a woman, uh, you you are the one who works for 40 kilometers, 14 kilometers to collect water. But then you are the last one to drink that water. You are the last one to to even eat the food because men eat first. And also, yeah. it's a region where. Yeah. No, 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 it's fine. I, I, it, it's wonderful that you're able to give us that insight into the culture of Madagascar, not just the data in terms of stats and where we are with drought, are we close to famine, etc. I heard the phrase, women eat, not from you, but I, I, I know the phrase, women eat least and last, right? Yeah. So if you have no food, that is a major problem. Let me bring you back here to the alarm that is now being sounded by the international community. Tina, you're, you're saying people don't even know where Madagascar is. They don't know that we're so vulnerable. Some of the international organizations do know this. WFP Madagascar, malnutrition among children expected to quadruple in southern Madagascar because of the drought led by climate crisis. So where, what are we looking at, Shelley, in terms of how many people are living on cacti, are living on insects? So because of drought, um, because of just absolutely no rain, uh, that the number of people on the brink of starvation in famine-like conditions is going to double. Um, we're coming up to what we call the lean season, which is that period between planting and harvesting. If you haven't had rain, if you haven't had the right drop of rain for three to four years, it's miserable. There's, there's, there's no hope in terms of what can I grow, what can I cultivate? Um, you're right, uh, what, what, Tina, when, when we talk about uh, it's an island, people always say, but can't, but can't you fish? The, the people that are affected are farmers. They only know farming. And because of the nature of cyclones that have hit Southern Africa, sandstorms, almost Sahelian type, that have swept um, from the coastal from the coastal dunes and just covered the land. When you fly over the land, when you see those drones, it is that sort of orangey sand color where it's impossible to grow anything. Um, so again, climate. This is 
the front line, yeah. the impact of climate change. And these people have done nothing to contribute to climate change. Oh, I'm, so, I, I'm, they, so, I'm so glad you said that. I, I'm, I'm going to bring Charles in here, Shelley, because I, I want to share the conversation between all of you. Landry Nintresti uh, is a regional director of 350africa.org. He points out what a lot of developer nations know is that they were not responsible for the climate crisis, but yet they are paying a high price. Price. This is Landry. Charles, will you listen to Landry and then come immediately off the bat with your own thoughts? So this situation put a spotlight on uh, the disproportionate nature of climate uh, uh, crisis, uh, which unfortunately uh, uh, kind of affect the countries that have contributed the least uh, to the crisis. Uh, it's also the climate impact and the disasters we're seeing in Madagascar give us a glimpse of a situation which is likely uh, to happen um, uh, soon or to become uh, a sad and shared reality across Africa and beyond where um, prolonged drought, um, terrible floods and intensive frequent extreme weather events are likely uh, to become um, 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 part of our daily life. Yes, so Fabi, uh, Landry is right. Madagascar and other countries that are in such areas, they contribute very little, or they have contributed very little when it comes to what causes climate change. Yet, they are the ones that are being disproportionately being affected because of geography. So you look, you look at the case of Madagascar and where it lies, and what we've seen over the last you know, four decades, the rainfall patterns have been diminishing over time. And let's remember that this particular area that we're talking about, it's already semi-arid, it's already dry. And so if you have you know, four decades of decreasing rainfall in this area, and then in the last three years, we've seen extreme drought in that area, what is left? Nothing. And so from where we sit, we see it as a moral imperative for the world to be able to help the people of Madagascar as we speak, because they have contributed very little to climate change. But because of where they lie, they are now being affected. And when we listen to the voices of the mothers, one mother that we spoke with, she said, what bothers me the most is that I am not able to feed my child. We're talking of the dignity of a mother, the pride that a mother has to be able to bring a child into this world and having that capability to be able to feed this child. Yet she finds herself in a situation where she's not able to feed this child and tears rolling down you know, her face, struggling. And so he's right, Landry is right. Mm -hmm. These countries have contributed very minimal, yet they are the ones that have been affected. And that's the reason why the whole globe that's why there is a moral imperative yeah. to make sure that we stop these people from suffering further. Let me just bring in some YouTube comments, Shelley, and let me put them to you and, and then also to you, Charles, as well. Just very briefly so that we can get through as many as possible. Kareem Borman on YouTube says, this is a reality for South Africa as well. Still people deny global warming. Leaders in this country, that's South Africa, still make use of coal power because they have shares and own these coal mines and they benefit. Um, this isn't even a wake up call, Shelley. This is a red flag that we're seeing right now in Madagascar. Go ahead, quick thoughts on this. Absolutely, and um, you know, you are, as Charles has said, you know, we, are seeing displacement from climate change, we are seeing, and where is there to go? People often say to me, well, can they move? Where would you move to? Because you have been in your villages with your families for years. This is the life that you know. It's very remote, it's very rural. Um, COVID, the pandemic has obviously meant that the country's gone into lockdown. So in terms of seasonal employment, livelihoods, rising food prices. Yes, it is effect affecting not only Madagascar, but globally there's a lot more hunger hotspots today than there probably were um, 12 months ago, 24 months ago. We're concerned, like your viewers and your listeners and, and the panellists today, is because if we don't act now, 
we will have failed people. I want to bring in David Beasley. He's the executive director of the World Food Programme. He was in Madagascar in June. And one of the things that David manages to do is he removes himself as, as a sort of an executive of, of, of a UN agency. And you feel that the real person is seeing what is happening in front of him. So he posted this on Facebook. Have a listen, have a look, viewers. This is the front line, the impact of climate change. People's lives have been devastated. These families here have literally had to migrate, sell everything that they have, uh, their home, their land, their pots and pans, and because the drought back to back. And, um, and this is not because of war or conflict. This is just because of climate change. So we're here on the front lines with them, saving lives and changing lives. So our audience guests are trying to come up with some ideas, some solutions for Madagascar. I'm sure that Tina and, and many people in Madagascar are doing exactly the same thing. This is Tendai. Tendai is saying as someone from Zimbabwe, which faces frequent droughts, they could introduce more drought-resistant and fast-growing crops and climate-proofing farming systems by the use of water retention methods as mulching and encouraging each household to grow enough for family. All right, so, so that's what Tendai was saying on Twitter. Charles, you know about farming. Is this a viable idea? For me, yes, because this is the time to be able to put all of these tools in the hands of our farmers to be able to help them. Because we know that if we do not, what is going to follow is not something that all of us are going to be proud of. So if you look at it very carefully in a typical farming environment, when the rains come in many of these areas, they come in torrents, they pour, and they run off. So part of what she's saying is to be able to make sure we can capture many of these, allow them to percolate into the soil. So not only are we preserving the water to be able to use for irrigation, but we're also allowing enough percolation to the soil to be able to recharge the underground water that we can let you on tap to be able to use. The second part is, with this, is about the whole drought um, crops that we're talking about, drought resistant crops. We know that it is going to happen. And the fact that we know it's going to happen means we have to do something now. There's research taking place that many of these crops that we know today will not survive in this extreme heat. And that's what has happened in Madagascar. So what we are trying to do, in, in, even in southern Madagascar, is to be able to work with these farmers to be able to bring in these drought-resistant crops to be able to help them, but also sometimes also to go back to some of those indigenous crops that we used to cultivate. In such dry area, there are certain crops that would not do well. Let me give an example, maize. Maize needs a lot of water and a lot of nitrogen. If that's what we are going to continue to grow in many of these drought areas, we're not going to be successful. So where is sorghum? Where is millet? So it's about, Femi, it's about the tools that we can be able to put into the hands of our farmers and to adapting. be able to withstand what's going on. And, mm -hmm. and, right. and cassava as well, right? Yeah. I mean, sorry, Femi, yes. to interrupt. It's That's just, okay. I mean, the other question I have both to Tina and Charles is, how do you change that habit of people? You know, how do we need money? We know we need money to get this off the ground and, and to make sure there's pipelines and water irrigation, water harvesting. But where we are today, we as WFP say we need $78.6 million just to provide food assistance, emergency food for people that are on the brink of starvation. So where are we going to get to in terms of changing the long-term development yeah, let's and what do we need? Let's bring T uh, Tina back in here. Tina, I'm going to show a couple of pictures here. Um, these, are, these, these are your team. Um, we've got young people here trying to affect change in Madagascar, trying to do things that may well change how the climate crisis is impacting the people of southern Madagascar. You've come with solutions for our show. Tell us one that's really important to you. Um, so uh, I'd like to, to share at least one positive, uh, some positive messages and solutions that we're having in Madagascar. Cause um, the, pro uh, the problem is now that most of the solutions are from top to the down. They are not solutions from the communities. They are not solutions from the population. Whereas 
We have young people, we have women organizations, we have local communities with solutions. They, they are really aware of the impact of climate change. And they are not only uh, beggars, they are not only begging for food. Uh, of course, they have dignity too. And, and that's what we want to share, this positive message in our country too. And, and uh, for, for example, these last few weeks, I've been working on launching a regional youth platform in this, uh, in this region, in the extreme south. We had capacity building, we had training with youth, and also the, the last few days I had the chance to work with, um, with a local uh, think tank uh, gathering, uh, gathering um, a diversity of actors like um, doctors, engineers, a student from high school, etc., sharing together solution for the solution for the community. Because um, Tina, can I ask uh, you something that our what? audience on YouTube are asking you, which is yeah, sure. Madagascar today, your neighbourhood tomorrow, which is a warning. And then, personally to you, what makes you think that the situation in southern Madagascar will get better? Just briefly, Tina, go ahead. Yeah, maybe I'm I'm too optimistic. No, <laughs> no, no. You can't you can't be too optimistic <laughs> for the stream. I, we need that after this conversation. Go for it. Just briefly. Yeah. So, uh, as an activist, I think that the change uh, the change is for our generation now. It's it's still possible to bring this posi this uh, positive change and impact uh, for the community. Um, what I also want to share is uh, the fact that. Uh, in the region, this region is considered as a cemetery of projects uh, for many years. There, there are many projects that, that have been uh, that, that were launched in this region of Madagascar, but didn't work because they didn't consider this community. They didn't consider youth, uh, youth who are part of who are now the majority of the population in Madagascar. We are 70 percent in Madagascar. And I'm wondering, Action Against Hunger, what food program? Have you worked with local youth organizations? Have you worked with the local university? Yes, we have solutions too. So now it's time to, to bring a real dialogue and to bring this change together. And that, yes. that will be my main message today. So Femi, Tina the, is right, yeah. right? It's about, it's about the empowerment of the people that we work with bringing local solutions to the problem. So in Action Against Hunger, in many of the places that we work in the South, it's, it's that approach that we continue to use. So let me give you an example. So we have these 25 mobile health and nutrition units that move around the, you know, part of the Grand South area mm -hmm. to be able to help you know, what is happening. Charles, there. I'm going to hurry when you we, along because we're almost at the end of the show. So make it a very brief example. Go for it. So we go in there, we have to save lives right there by working with the mother and empowering them to be make sure that the child is not dead. And so it's about bringing them into our discussions and empowering them with the tools they need mm. to make sure that they can be able to do their work and do it well. All right, whenever we do a show like this where we are showing people in the world in dire need, people always ask, how can we help? Here is one way. We're in this cycle of failed harvest. There's no planting, there's no harvest, there's no crops. And people have already sold everything. They've sold their mattresses, their cooking pots. They have nothing left. Seed are providing basic food, infant supplements, rice, beans, oil, and we know it's working. We can see children recovering. We are saving lives every day. But seed are limited due to a lack of world understanding of the dire situation in Madagascar and donating. You can find Seed online and in the closing 30 seconds of this show, Shelley, if they want to support the work of the WFP, what can people do? People can um, donate money. Uh, we can also just make sure that we get the word out. I, I, you know, yeah. I love the passion of Tina. Let's keep, let's keep talking to the youth. Let's get the women out there. Let's make sure that we Thanks, continue Shelley. this fight. Really appreciate you. Shelley, Christina, Thank you. Charles, everybody who was contributing on YouTube for your questions and your comments, really appreciate you. Thank you so much. See you next time.